Good morning, Waterford. Uh, I'm Cindy, and this is Darren. We are two of your pastoral team members. And want to make sure that you are aware that yesterday there was a mass shooting in Goshen. Actually, not very far from here. I'm close to Prairie View School. There were five people involved, two of whom have died, um, two who remain in critical condition. Um, the names have not been released yet, but what we do know is that this impacts our youth and our children, and that they have relationships with the people who have died, um, who are critically wounded, and perhaps even the shooter. We must begin today with an awareness that life is fragile and that God is faithful. And so I'm going to light our peace lamp. And as I do, I invite you to be in prayer for the families involved, for those who are grieving, for those who are sitting next to a bedside wondering if their loved one's going to live, for the many children and youth who will learn later how this impacts their life. Let us also not forget the police and the first responders who have responded to this scene and who they themselves are dealing with, all that this means for them. I invite you to pray. And then Pastor Darren will lead us in singing, Lord, have mercy. Please know that Darren and I are here, along with Melissa Chupp and Francis, our interim pastors. Um, please reach out if you need us to hold space with you. Let us be in prayer for our community, um, trusting that the Spirit's at work even as we groan our prayers. Amen. I invite you to turn in the uh, blue book to 590 to begin and have 600 nearby also. We'll go right into the second song as well. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known. I invite you to stand as well, number 590 and then 600.
Welcome to our gathered time of worship this morning. We began on a fairly somber note. And I find it very interesting to see that the message today and even my comments this morning um, apply. And yet I was not looking at a tragedy locally. So welcome this morning to this gathered time. Those of you that are gathering with us on live streaming, welcome to you. And uh, our sound and video people, they're amazing. You know, when, when we don't know they're there, they really do a good job. <laughs> if we know they're there, then something's not working quite right. But, you know, we're one of those who tries to escape some northern Indiana winter, and we're gone. Uh, part of the winter, and uh, so live streaming has been a very vital connection for us with you. Not necessarily live because the time zone changes and so on, we're usually listening by recording. But uh, thank you guys and others who are not uh, in the booth today. We appreciate that. I'm Jim Gosho, my wife Lila, and um, we just Thank you for being our church community. Well, I was going to ask you if it's been a difficult week as we think about the mass shooting in Buffalo a week ago yesterday. The war in Ukraine continues on. There's conflicts in other parts of the world. Have we heard enough bad news do we seek to just kind of numb ourselves to the news that keeps coming? And I struggle with this, aside from yesterday's situation. Have I heard enough? Do I really care? And if I care, then what do I do? What can I do to bring life, healing, and hope to others? It seems to me that conflict begins with a seed of fear quite often. And I'm not speaking specifically to the situation yesterday at this point. 
but fear of the loss of power, control, or position. Fear of the other, whoever that may be, whatever color of skin that may be, or religious beliefs that may be. Fear of the other and the unknown due to not spending time learning to know the other. Fears can escalate, fed by false information and conspiracy theories designed and spread by those who are seeking to gain and retain power and control. Fear leads to hatred and motivation to, um, to marginalize others, to enslave them, either through actual slavery, as we think of different parts of the world, or slavery through minimum wages and underemployment that keep people marginalized. Fear can make them the enemy, get rid of the other, get them out of the country, and destroy the other, very similar to the story that we're going to be talking about today. Shifra and Pua. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> They're in the Bible. Uh, do you know the story about Shifra and Pua? What chapter is it in? This is a quiz now. <laughs> Tell me what chapter of the Bible they are referred to. Come on, don't everybody pop up at once. That's unfair. She's <laughs> preaching the sermon. <laughs> well, I was going to give you the clue. You could, uh, you could look at the scripture reading in your bulletin today, and that might be a clue. Cindy's going to tell us much more about them and how, in the face of fear, they brought life. And my goal, my hope for us today is that we can find ways to, in the face of fear all around us and around the world, how do we bring healing and hope? I'd like you to join us in a call to worship. And as we read this together, let the call to worship help you begin to focus on bringing life to others. I'll read the dark, you, or the light, and you read the dark. Be sincere in your love for others. Love each other and honor others more than yourself. When others are happy, be happy with them. When others are sad, be sad. Make friends with those who have a different skin color or nationality or a different religious understanding. Make friends with ordinary people. Let racism and superiority cease. But try to earn the respect of others and do your best to live at peace with everyone. Do not let people defeat you, but defeat people with good. And together, love God and love your neighbor. Bob will lead us in another song. There is a line of women, number 546. <clears throat> I invite you to stand again, please. Uh, quite a number of women are mentioned in this song, women who have uh, done their work for God among people.
Rod, are you here? There he is. Okay. Rod is going to share a moment in mission with us. And again, uh, ties right in with our service today. Good morning. Shifra and Pua are great examples for us. Because when they needed to say no, they said no. When they needed to stand up for justice, they did. I'm here to talk about uh, the Poor People's Campaign. And if you don't remember anything else about uh, this morning, uh, I want you to remember that on June 18th, there's a mass gathering in Washington, DC, and everyone is invited. And you'll hear that invitation uh, a little later on. But um, this work started out uh, through Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, as his work with uh, systemic racism grew, he began to understand how deeply entwined that was with economic disadvantage. And uh, so as he got toward the latter part of his life, he started working also uh, very much at economic issues. And um, today this movement is carrying on. Uh, from uh, Dr. King's 1968 Poor People's Campaign. Uh, now uh, there's, there's a Poor People's Campaign in the present. And uh, so it's, uh, it's focused on, on five uh, pillars uh, that, that we need to say no to and we need to find alternatives to. Uh, systemic racism, systemic poverty, uh, ecological de devastation, militarism, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And uh, so I'm going to invite you uh, to, to listen now as uh, Dr. William Barber II, who's one of the leaders of this uh, work, uh, is going to speak to us a little bit. Team. That's it. it takes a meeting. No one person can do it alone. That's right. That's right. No one group can do it alone. Yeah. That's right. No one surgeon can do it alone. Yeah. That's right. And when I left his office, I began to think that the same is true if you're going to change the heart of a nation. That's right. There has to be a meeting. And then the Holy Ghost got a hold of me and said, Baba, you didn't have to go to the doctor. You could have went to God. Because... Everywhere in the Bible there was fundamental change, it began with a meeting. Yeah. Yes, sir. In the first book of the Bible, it doesn't, God doesn't say let me, he says let us. Yeah. Uh, there's a meeting that came together that created hu cre humanity as we know it. When they got ready to deal with Pharaoh, they had a meeting down at the Red Sea. Yeah. They all came together and the sea opened up and Pharaoh drowned. Yeah. Ah, uh, when Goliath was running around saying what he was going to do, David had a meeting with five rocks. He got one for Goliath and four for the rest of his cousins. Ah, uh, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, they had a meeting. Down in the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, the Bible said they had a meeting. And the bones came together and the spirit blew on them. Jesus had a meeting one day with 5,000 and a few loaves of bread. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a meeting because the Bible says the prophets that had been dead long ago when he died, they got up. On Pentecost, there was a meeting. The wind began to blow and, the, and tongues of fire came and, and, the, and the word came that, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. But then I started reading the history in 1852, after the Dred Scott decision, there was a meeting. The abolitionists came together and they said, maybe this decision is just one link of the chain of events necessary for the whole downfall of the system of slavery. Therefore, what they have done has only emboldened and intensified our agitation. There was a meeting when Sojourner Truth and Lucretia Mott came together and they began to build the women's suffrage movement and they joined at Seneca Fall. There was a meeting when the social gospel movement came together and they began to declare in the face of gross greed and industrialism that we could not turn away from the children and they asked the question, what would Jesus do? 
in the 1920s, there was a meeting called the Bonus Marches. Yes, and folk came together to fight for fair wages, and that led to the New Deal, yes, when yes. black and white and Jewish civil rights lawyers had a meeting yes, in the 1950s, and they decided to take down Jim Crow yes. and to take down Separate But Equal. Yes. In Montgomery, they had a meeting. Yes. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, they had a meeting. Then in Selma, they had a meeting. Ah, uh, at the Greensboro, at the lunch counter, they had a meeting. In Birmingham, they had a meeting. Started with 40 people, but by the time it was over, thousands had been arrested and Bull Connor was brought down. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. When Cesar Chavez was alive, they had a meeting in California. And the workers marched and they fasted. Right now at Oak Flats, the Apache Nation is having a meeting. And all of these meetings changed the heart of the nation at that particular point. I just come by to declare that it's time on June 18th for us to have a meeting. For us to have a moral meeting. For us to have a meeting in the streets. Children got to be saved. It's time to have a meeting. Sick folk got to be healed. It's time to have a meeting. Low wage workers got to be paid. It's time to have a meeting. Housing must be provided for all. It's time to have a meeting. The atmosphere must be saved. It's time to have a meeting. Indigenous people must be treated right. It's time to have a meeting. Voting rights must be expanded and protected. It's time to have a meeting. We're spending too much money trying to blow up the world rather than save the world. It's time to have a meeting. Too much religion is being used to push hate rather than love. It's time to have a meeting. We've got to change the heart of this nation. It's time to have a meeting. This nation needs a heart transplant. It's time to have a meeting. Are you all ready for the meeting? Are you ready for the meeting? Are you ready for the meeting? God said, if you will have a meeting, I'll show up. I'll bless you. I'll give you power. I'll strengthen you. I'll make you strong. I'll give you favor. I'll make you able to turn this country around. But first, you must have a meeting. Okay, so you understand why I did that rather than trying to do that myself, right? <laughs> so, you're all invited to the meeting, June 18th. If you're interested, let me know. Uh, transportation options from Goshen are, are there. Um, and, yeah, uh, we have a, a group, a local cluster that meets every couple of weeks, and if you're interested in participating with that, uh, let me know. Thanks. Well, our services are pretty tame, aren't they? <laughs> Come on, let's get going. <laughs> well, it's time to uh, give you opportunity to share your offering this morning. We invite you to come forward and make use of the basket. Some of you may have given online already, and uh, come and share your gifts.
May our offering be an extension of our desire to bring life, healing, and hope to each other, each of us gathered here, and to those within our community who may be hurting, who are marginalized, and may feel unwelcomed and displaced. Guide this church family as we seek to walk with you in giving your love to all people. Amen. Children, it's children's time, and uh, Jerry is going to be doing that again. And you know, we see Jerry up here quite often. I didn't ask Jerry about this, but uh, kids, do we need a name for Jerry? You know, you see him up here quite often, and I, I think maybe we ought to come up with a name for him. You know, I thought about a couple, you know, we could call him Uncle Jerry or Grandpa Jerry, or Tom, call him Tom, okay. <laughs> Hi. You can just call me. Gerald. No, <laughs> you can just call me Jerry. <laughs> yeah. This summer, we are talking about the faces of God. And these are times that we see God when we look at other people. The Bible says, God is love. So when I see people who love and care about people, I see God. I'll tell you three stories about three people. <laughs> Why would you suspect I would ever tell a story that was not true? <laughs> even if a, even if something did not happen exactly the way I tell it, it can still be true. Okay. So, the first story happened about 65 years ago. Yes, 65 years ago. <laughs> I am 10 years older than that. Oh, very good. Okay. Okay. That's right. So, my mother ordered a fishing pole for my birthday from Sears Roebuck and Company. And you guys know what? I see some frowns like you don't... We're, don't you order stuff from Sears Roebuck? No. You don't. Well, many years ago, we used to get books called catalogs and people would order things from it and the store was called Sears Roebuck so that's what she ordered from and it was a fishing pole for me and it had not come and so on the day of my birthday we went to the post office to see if it was there and it wasn't there yes I did I, I eventually did get it. But because it wasn't there on my birthday, I remember this from 65 years ago, my mother cried. And at that time, I saw God's love and tears in her crying. My second story comes from the last 50 years. And it is a story about my wife. And, okay if I tell this? <laughs> okay, it, do, it really doesn't matter if it's okay or not. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to, okay. So, I, I, I will tell you the story now. I rode my bike home from school where I taught, 
and it was down a pretty steep hill. And I have no idea what happened, but pretty soon my face was face down on the road. And I was really a bloody mess. I went to our house and I told Barbara I had an accident. Now, I am going uh I'm going to give you a chance to decide what Barbara said when she saw me. Oh yes, I was really bloody. So, the first choice you could make is you'd better clean the mess up off the floor and don't use any good towels for that. <laughs> the second choice is, oh no, I need to get you to a doctor right now. I feel so bad. How many people vote for the first one? The first one where she said, you need to clean that bloody mess off the floor. <laughs> How many of you vote for the second one? Oh, no, I need to get you to a doctor right now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, now, there were, there were just two. So, I heard God's love and care in her voice. And after, over the last 50 years, I could tell many more stories about all of these people. <laughs> It was the second one. Oh, no. You are hurt so bad. I feel so bad. I need to get you to a doctor. That, I'm, I'm sorry for not telling you which one it was. Yes. Okay, number three. This happened almost 50 years ago. I graduated from college in Harrisonburg, Virginia, at Eastern Mennonite College. And I came to Ohio to teach physical education at Adriel School. Have any of you ever gone to a new school? No, I haven't. Okay. It would seem to me that if you've gone to a school, it was new at the beginning. Yeah. So going to a new school can be kind of scary. I was starting a new job. I did not know people. However, I had a very special principal. The principal was my boss. She was a short lady, but she was very special to me because she always asked me, how are things going? And she encouraged me. She asked me to talk to me, to her. And she taught me much about how to be a teacher. And we also spent a lot of time talking about God. And after she retired, I visited her many times. And I saw the face of God in Sarah Ellen Stolzfus. And by the way, she is the aunt of a couple of people in this congregation, Helen Bowman and Lowell Stolzfus, and the great aunt and great great aunt of their children. But she was a very special person. Now, all three of these people really loved flowers. And I could tell you stories about how they taught me about flowers. So I still enjoy flowers. And I have flowers and vegetables and things outside. And as you leave today, take a plant. And remember, people who you see God in their faces. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving us people who show us your love and your care. Help us to spread your love and your care to others around us. Amen.
The scripture this morning is, well, we've already been, already been told, haven't we? Exodus 1, verses 6 to 21, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. In time, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Python and Ramsey as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the field, they were ruthless in all their demands. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave his order to the Hebrew midwives, Shephora and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this, he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Blessings to you, Cindy, as you come to minister to us. So as Jerry said, we were continuing in our summer worship series of Faces of Our Faith as we dig into specific stories of some of the biblical characters. So last week, we started this story at the beginning with creation. And I would remind us that we're doing this series to correlate with Pastor Katie and her sabbatical. So Katie has her, this theme of her sabbatical is spilling the tea, telling a more compassionate story. And on her very last Sunday with us, Katie invited us to share a cup of tea with each other this summer, or another hot beverage for those of you who just can't live without coffee. But to share, share a cup of tea or coffee and to tell stories, right? To, to tell our story and then to receive the gift of hearing someone else's story. Well, I thought this week, wouldn't it be fascinating to share a cup of tea with Shipra and Pua. Just think about the stories that they would have to tell. 
Or, or what would it be like to share a cup of tea with this unnamed Pharaoh? I wondered what questions we might have for him. Well, today we're going to spill the tea, so to say, and we're going to dig into the story of Shipra and Pua of these midwives. And as we do so, we're going to be challenged by their story. We're going to be challenged and invited to change, to become more active in ushering in life, in preserving the sanctity of all life. So our passage today is in Exodus chapter 1. However, to really understand the context, to understand what's significant about what Shipra and Pua have accomplished, we have to start the story earlier in Genesis. And the book of Genesis ends by telling us that Joseph has died. But that's actually not enough of the context to even get the whole picture. We need to go further back into the story. So if you turned back into Genesis to, to chapter 37, we would read about how Joseph had been sold into slavery by his dear brothers. <laughs> I can make a comment, but I won't. But, so he's sold into slavery by his dear brothers, and we're told that he ends up in Egypt. And then in, verse, or in chapter 39, we read the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And so Joseph resists the demands of Potiphar's wife. He is wrongly accused. He is thrown into prison. And then while in prison, he begins to rise through the ranks of leadership and responsibility to the point that he begins to interpret other people's dreams. And the Pharaoh at the time learned of the skilled behavior, the skilled learning that Joseph had. And so the Pharaoh summoned Joseph into his court and asked him to interpret his dreams. And and Joseph continues to rise in ranks until he becomes the second in command next to Pharaoh. Now, the next chunk chunk of the story here talks about how Joseph's father and brothers make the journey to Egypt because of a famine. And it tells us this extended story of how reconciliation eventually happened. But it also tells a story about how, how these immigrants, these foreigners, rise in status to be the most favored immigrants in the land. So then we have to ask the question, well, what changed? Like, what changes from the end of Genesis to the beginning of Exodus? So for that, I would have you turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. And so we're told at the end of chapter 50 that Joseph dies. At the beginning of chapter 50, we're told that Jacob dies, his father And I want to read to you about this this funeral procession for Jacob because it really highlights the differences between the Israelites' experience with Pharaoh here in Genesis and what they're going to experience in Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, look at verse 7. So so Jacob has died. Joseph goes to the Pharaoh and asks for permission to travel to go bury his father. And Pharaoh says yes. Yes. So in verse 7, it says this, So Joseph went up to bury his father. Aha. Listen who goes with him. All of Pharaoh's officials accompanied him. The dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Verse 9 Chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. It tells a story that Genesis ends with, with, with Joseph traveling with this huge contingency of, of Egyptian officials who are traveling with Joseph for this very elaborate morning ceremony for a foreigner, for an immigrant. So what changes? How do they go from that reception in the land to how they're received in Exodus? We look at our passage for today in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Exodus. It says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. They increased in numbers and became so numerous that they filled the land. Friends, God answered God's covenantal blessing. Do you remember Abraham? 
Aha, this is lived out here. But verse 8 is where it changes. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. There's a new king who didn't know Joseph, who didn't know the story, who didn't know the context, to whom Joseph meant nothing. And this new king, this new pharaoh, rose to power. He looked out at the situation, and he experienced the Hebrews, these Israelites, and he immediately had fear for his power. And it it feels kind of like seemingly just like that, that these Hebrews went from being the most elevated, esteemed immigrant in the land to being oppressed slaves, to being the feared other, to being the one that we should kill. And it all comes from fear. Well, fear is really powerful. Fear can motivate one's actions and responses. In this case, the fear that this unnamed pharaoh had, it led him to experience signaling out this minority, this, this outsider group, and calling them the enemy. What's really fascinating to know about the pharaoh's assessment in verse 9 is that it's simply not true. That the Israelites had not, in fact, history would show, had not, in fact, become more populous than the Egyptians. And then he adds in verse 10, which further compounds this false statement. And he begins to create this clear strategy to create an enemy within. To begin to stir up this fear of the foreigner or the immigrant other. And then Pharaoh wastes no time in putting together a plan to deal with this very dangerous element in their midst. But keep in mind, we're we're not told that there's anything that the Israelites have done that communicates that they are, in fact, a threat. It simply arises from Pharaoh's fears. Now, ultimately, Pharaoh will try three different tactics to reduce the perceived threat of the Israelites. And so first we told that he enslaves them under brutally circumstance, brutally difficult circumstances. And yet in verse 12 we read that the more that they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, the more that they spread. So next in verse 15, this unnamed Pharaoh invites two women to his court. That in itself is noteworthy and quite exceptional. There's an unnamed pharaoh invites two women, and then there are two named women, very noteworthy, Shipra and Pua. And there are two midwives, also very noteworthy. Remember, pharaoh has a fear of his loss of power. So we watch him move from just oppression to move toward death. One could even go as far as to say that he is driven to death for others. His fears established his hatred and fed his view that the other is the enemy and that they should be destroyed. It is sad to say that we still witness this warped thought process in 2022. How one's fears establish their hatred and it feeds their views that the other is the enemy who should be destroyed. Friends, this is not of God. Pharaoh's fears must have some point become irrational. I mean, listen to the irony in the circumstances. This unnamed pharaoh is looking out at what he names as as a massive, overwhelming, uncontainable situation, and he demands for two women to take care of all of it. The irony is not lost on them, nor should it be on us. It also must be named that Pharaoh sees no threat from these two women. 
And yet it will be these two women as well as additional women in chapter 2 who will ultimately be his undoing. So this unnamed pharaoh commands Shipra and Pua, the midwives, to kill all the baby boys born to the Hebrew women. However, Pharaoh does not take into account what the midwives fear, or perhaps stated more appropriately, whom the midwives fear. They do not fear Pharaoh. Instead, we're told in verse 17 that because the midwives feared God, that they did not do what the king of Egypt asked them to do. For you see, fear has more than one definition. In the case of Pharaoh, the fear is caused by believing that something or someone is dangerous. But on the other hand, the fear of the midwives is defined as as regard with, with reverence or awe. And so not only do the midwives fear God, regard God with awe and reverence, they also regard all of life with this. This week I came across um, a significant commentary writing by Kat Armas. Kat is a Cuban-American immigrant Old Testament scholar, and she provides some really helpful perspectives for this text. And so she, she explains that in the ancient Near East, midwives, like Shipra and Pua, actually had two very distinct roles. And the first one was, in fact, to help deliver the, the birth of a baby. But the second one is that they also played a spiritual and healing role, too. I find it fascinating to know that midwifery in the ancient Near East was actually considered a, a, a vocation of spirituality. It was a spiritual vocation. So not only then did the midwife comfort the mother and help birth the baby, but they also prayed religious protection over the child and the mother and engaged in significant rituals which were seen as sacred acts. Kat Armas then describes it like this. She says, The embodied wisdom of the midwives in Exodus comes together with their faith in God to bring forth new life in the world. And she summarizes it by this, which I think is just so provocative. She says, we often talk about the midwives in passing as if they are nothing more than the women who disobey Pharaoh. But, she says, history proves that they are more than that. These midwives are ancient keepers of wisdom, and they are women who love God. In summary, she says, their faith lived out through their role as spiritual healers and co-creators of new life, prompts them to engage in civil disobedience to enact justice, not unlike many courageous women of color throughout all of history. In verse 17, back in our text, we read that Shipra and Pua let the boys live. However, fascinating, a closer translation of the Hebrew text further accentuates their active response, their active engagement with this. So most of our, most of our translations will something say to the effect that they, Shipra and Pua, let the boys live. However, a closer translation of the Hebrew would actually read like this. They made the boys to live. Or... They saw to it that the boys lived. So there's Pharaoh, full of fear, was driven to cause death. And then there's these midwives who are also full of fear, who were driven to help preserve life and the sanctity of all life. And so I think, wow, if we sat down to have tea today with Shipra and Pua, I think they would ask us two questions. I think they would look at us and they would say, who or what do you fear? And I think they would say, be really, be really careful and think critically how you answer that question. Because what or whom you fear will determine how you respond to self, others, and God. Friends, it determines how we respond to Goshen shootings. What 
or whom do you fear? The second question I think Shipra and Pua would ask us is, and how will you become more like us? How will you help usher in new life and to preserve the sanctity of all life? How will you be active in this? This morning, I look out at you as a congregation, and I see many modern-day midwives. I have shared cups of tea with a number of you, Diet Coke with some of you, and I know from some of your stories that you have been acting as modern-day midwives. You have been helping to usher in life, saying no to the empire and yes to God's kingdom. This morning, I want to interview two of you to hear more of your story. So I would invite Jim and Lila to come up. Now, Jim and Lila haven't given birth themselves or helped anyone else give birth recently, but they have had experience about being modern-day midwives. So, Jim and Lila... In talking with you recently, I have realized that you've had the recent experiences of being modern-day midwives, just like Shipra and Pua, and you've helped to usher in life and preserve the gift of all lives. So I'm wondering if you would share with the congregation about the International Rescue Committee and what its role is in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, the, interna- <coughs> the International Rescue Committee works in uh, 40 countries and about 20 cities in the U.S. Uh, And their focus is serving people who have been displaced by war, uh, conflict, or natural disasters. Their work in the United States has primarily focused on refugee resettlement. During the previous government administration, the plight of asylum seekers, which is a little different from refugees, Uh, became a major humanitarian crisis. Uh, Asylum seekers have a legal right to be here, contrary to what we oftentimes hear. ICE, or the Immigrations and Custom Enforcement Agency, uh, had been dropping off asylum seekers at the, uh, uh, taking them from detention centers and dropping them off at the downtown Phoenix bus station and this could be any time of the day or night. Um, they wouldn't oftentimes even know what city they were in, let alone have food or uh, shelter, uh, and no one to really help them figure out where do I go from here. This was creating a real problem in the city. And uh, so the city asked uh, International Rescue Committee, IRC, to step in and they created a welcome center for asylum seekers, uh, mostly run by volunteers. And uh, they were able to, the city gave them use of an old abandoned uh, schoolhouse uh, where they would uh, be able to do this. So ICE started dropping the asylum seekers off there. So what particular roles did each of you do as you volunteered at the welcome center? Well, first of all, I'll just say that we were at the Welcome Center on Mondays when we were in voluntary or in uh, Sioux. And um, then we saw such a great need there that we decided we would just continue volunteering on Mondays the next two months that we stayed in Phoenix, February and March. And so this gave us an opportunity to overlap with some of the... uh, Goshen modern-day midwives. Um, It gave, uh, some of those volunteers were uh, Bob and Rachel Brenneman, Meryl and Lola Gingrich, uh, Bob and Karen Albrecht, and Gary and Carol Shetler. So I worked in the kitchen most of the time. Um, The things that I did, I did a very, variety of things, but uh, help stock the fruit cart, which was in the cafeteria with apples, oranges, bananas, whatever was available. And um, 
helped with breakfast items sometimes, but most of all, I did peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They uh, wanted peanut butter and jelly sandwiches available for uh, whenever they needed to hand them out. And so when I would go in on Monday mornings, they would often say, well, we need 100, or we need 150 today. And so it was a dedicated morning making uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And that 100 or 100 and uh, whatever, 150, was not an indication of how many people were there. There would be hundreds there. Uh, one Monday, we were pretty overwhelmed with 560 people uh, that had been dropped off during the night or by noon already. We had 560 people that we were trying to care for. So my work was, uh, we were there long enough that uh, I kind of knew the ropes, and so my work was seeing where the help was needed. And... Uh, uh, didn't really require a high skill level, just a, a willingness to do whatever, whatever is needed. Most days, that meant restocking water in five refrigerators in different locations. Um, it meant a lot of emptying trash or moving supplies to where they were needed, uh, supervising showers. Uh, they wanted two of us at all times, uh, uh, coordinating and giving them the opportunity to get a shower and helping occasionally with a couple of emergencies. Um, we didn't help with the delivery, but a baby was born at the Welcome Center. And uh, another time we had to get an ambulance uh, to take a woman into the hospital. We think totally dehydrated when she arrived. So today we're looking at these midwives of Shipra and Pua, and I'm wondering, Jim and Lila, if you could share with the congregation a story of how you functioned in a similar way to the midwives. And so like, how did you, like the midwives, help usher in life and bless the sanctity of all life? Well, some of the things that the Welcome Center provided were a cold breakfast, a hot lunch, and an evening meal. Uh, a shower, a change of clothes if there were donated clothes available their size, uh, a cot if they needed to stay overnight, help in contacting their sponsor, and transportation to the bus and airport. Uh, there were families with babies and small children who sometimes had special needs, and so they would uh, come to the kitchen and ask for what they needed, and we would do our best to provide that, and they were always very appreciative. Um, at other times, there might be a knock on the door, and I would go, and it'd be a small child, um, kind of shy, and they wanted something. And it was times like that that I really wish I knew a foreign language. Um, but with motions and maybe somebody else who was standing close by, we were able to uh, interpret what they wanted. And so when I came back with it, they would, uh, their eyes would light up and they would smile and say thanks. And so these were times of, of caring. The, uh, seeing the fear in people's eyes was uh, really hard for me. Uh, especially the children. And, uh, you know, they have been traumatized getting in their own country that they have come from. And now they've been in ICE detention, uh, treated like criminals. Uh, they've been held in privately run for-profit detention centers in a cold jail cell. Um, they were actually referred to by these asylum seekers as ICE boxes and they didn't mean immigration services. It was cold and, uh, uh, and inadequate food. Uh, they've been threatened, intimidated, often separated from spouse and children. And now they're in another new place. And what's going to happen to me here? What are these people going to do to me? How will I be treated? So how do you smile through a mask? How do you get your eyes to communicate that 
I love you, I care about you, and I want to help you. Uh, how do you communicate love and acceptance with language barriers and not having French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Ukrainian, and some African languages? At this point, asylum seekers had not experienced any welcome in our country, let alone any expressions of love and acceptance. So taking a moment to uh, pay attention to a child. Offer, offering a helping hand or having a scissors available. Yeah, a scissors. You see, this for-profit detention operators also had ankle monitors that they would lease to the government. And these were randomly used, mostly on young women. No one could tell us why. Uh, they were big clunkers. I've, back work I've done years ago, I've seen ankle monitors. These were huge. And there's no way you can get your pants off to get a shower with those on. So we had a scissors. <laughs> so they could cut their pant leg up just far enough to get off, get them off, and hopefully they could at least have shorts out of them at the end. So if we didn't have any clothing that would fit them, they would at least have something to put on afterwards. Kindness makes a difference. I want to read a quote from Old Testament professor Amy Merrill Willis. And Merrill Willis writes this. She says, the work of these midwives counteracts the psychology of hatred and fear that motivates Pharaoh. Moreover, their collective work is a gracious defiance because of the way it embraces life and blurs Pharaoh's attempts to draw lines of distinction between us and them between Egyptian and Hebrew, between dominating and dominated. And so I wonder, Jim and Lila, if you could share a story of how you, when you experienced your own actions as, as midwives, embracing, embracing life and blurring the lines of distinction between us and them. I took a lot of trash out. <laughs> uh, but one day when I was taking a load of trash out, I saw two girls, probably eight and nine, uh, kind of at the side. And uh, one of the girls just really looked sad. And the other girl, I think, was trying to cheer her up by doing a little dance. She was a pretty good little dancer. I stopped and watched. And the dancing girl happened to see me and just got that look of fear. I tried to smile and uh, did a little clap on my hands. And she looked at her father and went over to him. I assumed it was her father. And uh, I went on with my trash run. When I came back in, she was doing a little dance again. And I stopped and she looked at me, paused, and then looked at her father, but she kind of kept on dancing. And so I did the best I could in giving a eye smile and clapped my hands again. And uh, then uh, I went to the father. And uh, fortunately, I just went over to him, and fortunately, he could speak a little English. I don't know what country he was from. He was not Hispanic. The dancing girl was his daughter, he told me. And the girl, the other girl, was a friend. Her parents had been killed. I just lingered with him. Lingered with him for a few minutes, and then I went on with my work. I'm supposed to be able to just tell the story. <laughs> Later that day as we were leaving, we were going by uh, just a crowd of people that were gathered at the room that uh, 
they would be given a chance to go in and get a, a set of clothing if we had it. And it was always crowded there. And this man, the father, he came out of the crowd with a big smile and motioned for me. He wanted me to come, come to him. So I went with him. He wanted me to meet his wife and he wanted her to meet me. And my comment was, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. I may never see them again, but I will remember them and from their smile, I think they'll remember me. And hopefully, they got a little taste of welcome. So many of us will never travel to Phoenix to work at the Asylum Seekers Welcome Center. So I wonder, Jim and Lila, what would you say to all of us? How can we be modern day midwives here in Goshen? Well, I think many here at church are already modern midwives. Um, for life and justice. Um, many at Waterford volunteer at the depot. Um, there's opportunity for anyone to donate things. And if you shop there, uh, the money is uh, used for needs around the world. A smile is a universal language. And so greet people with a smile. Let them know you care and that they are welcome. There's other agencies that are working at bringing wholeness and healing and hope. Uh, Center for Healing and Hope, uninsured and underinsured uh, people helping them. A Center for Community Justice, you know, our criminal justice system in this country does not work. And there's efforts and some of our people work there. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign we heard about this morning uh, learn to know a neighbor um, who may have a different background than you have. Uh, speak against the lies and the conspiracy theories, theories that, uh, that so, hate, so hate and divide us. And this is a hard one because it's so ingrained in us, but I th really believe that we need to examine the inherent racism and superiority supremacy elements uh, within each of us and work to counter the cultural and history uh, which is so much a part of this country. We need not fear the other and we have opportunity to reach out and do that. And I think as Christians we're, we're required to do that. Uh, you know, in Matthew, uh, you know, Jesus said or that I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. In many places we're told about the foreigner and uh, the foreigner residing among us like uh, uh, the one in Leviticus. Uh, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner resides among you, must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. And that's concluded by, I am the Lord your God. And what I hear in that is, I don't always know how to relate to someone. I don't know how to do that, but God enables us to do what we need to do in sharing love and bringing wholeness and healing to others. With God's grace and God's strength, may we become modern day midwives. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.
The response song is number 208 and speaks of Mary's response to God on her life. Number 208. <clears throat> What a privilege it is to be able to enter God's presence together, to pray for one another, for our community, for our world, and how difficult it is to find words together sometimes. This is a reason I love to sing in prayer. I think silence offers us the same opportunity to hold the space in God's presence um, and to enter into the groaning of the spirit for us, with us, shaping us into people who can grieve together, rejoice together, and walk together in the way of Jesus. And so I invite you to keep the prayers that are listed in the bulletin with you throughout this week. Pray for those listed and named, for those who are experiencing illness for our congregation, for those of us who will be delegates for the special delegate session of MCUSA next weekend. And I'm going to invite us to spend about a minute of silence, and I will close the prayer then with number 994 in Voices Together. You don't need to follow it, but that's where my words will come from at that time. And in the silence, I invite us to trust the Spirit's groaning and to trust the arms of Christ embracing us and that we join with God in the cries of mothers who are weeping and sisters and brothers and friends in Ukraine, in Buffalo, across the country and the world, and here in Goshen, in our own community, in our own families. 
Loving God, we enter into this silence and give thanks for your presence enfolding us in this space that we share. Gracious God, when there is nothing we can say, we give you thanks that your spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Loving God, when there is nothing we can do, we give you thanks that you are working for good in this world of struggle and pain. Holy God, when there is nothing else we know, still we give you thanks that nothing in life or in death, nothing in heaven or on earth, nothing in this world or in the world to come will ever separate us from your great love through Christ Jesus. Amen. invite you to stand in body or spirit and turn to number 586 and Voices Together, which will be our sending song, All Will Be Well. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the very face of God smile upon you and be gracious to you. May God's very presence embrace you and give you peace. May it be so. Amen.